the book of Mark. Amen. Mark in chapter number 8. Still in chapter number 8 tonight. Mark in chapter number 8. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Look down at verse number 31. Just got a few verses tonight. We'll look at it. We're in praise. So let's read. We'll get right down to this. Uh, this evening had a good night. Last night I was over at Gospel Life Baptist Church. I was going to mention on Sunday. It's totally slip my mind. Uh, Brother Chris Dallas was over there preaching. And, and so we slid over there last night. Got to hear. Uh, There's me and Sam actually. Uh, kids had other stuff going on. And, Forgot so much they even had other plans going on. So Sam and I was able to go over there and enjoy some some preaching. Love love brother Dallas, amen. And, and uh, he he uh, says hello to you all. He's a blessing. Uh, Mark chapter eight, verse number thirty one. The Bible says, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Uh, and he spake. That saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Interesting, uh, interesting conversation between the Savior and Peter in this. And so, now as we're Mark, of course, we've talked about this as we've studied the Gospel of Mark. It's a very fast-paced gospel. The record here is very fast-paced. Not that it's intentionally leaving out detail. It's just this is this is how God planned the book of Mark to be. And it's very, very quickly through the ministry of our Savior. Very moved very quickly through it. And at this point in the ministry of our Savior, we're, we're getting to the point where his popularity is on the decline. Um, and we, we've, we've considered that before in, in previous messages. We know that as you get closer to the cross, it gets lonely. And we've used that as a, as a thought, as an illustration to our own personal lives, the closer you get to the Lord, the closer you get to crucifying the flesh, the lonely it's going to be. And the same thing, I mean, really, that's, that we get that illustration from the real life, uh, the real life story of our Savior Jesus Christ. As he got closer to the cross, uh, he became less and less popular, and, and it got lonelier for him, uh, and it certainly was becoming less and less popular with those that were devout Jews. They they were developing a, a an intense uh, hatred for him, and of course, this season of intensity, this this difficulty that he was in. Was, uh, was going to continue uh, and then conclude with him on the cross of Calvary. Of course, not, not fully conclude. Uh, I guess you could say pause for a few days. Amen? Um, but that's where it would end up, it would end up uh, coming to uh, would be uh, to the point where they're, they're crying, crucify him, crucify him. And so from this moment forward in the ministry of our Savior, he's, he's beginning to focus more now on and making sure that his disciples have everything they need to be enabled to continue on in his absence. So he's preparing them now uh, for the cross. He's preparing them for his departure, preparing, making them ready uh, to for the Great Commission. Amen? And that's what we really, when we, we think about that, as he's making them ready, we can draw an awful lot of parallels to ready us and to prepare us and to encourage us and empower us and challenge us to get out there to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so uh, it's, a, it, it's kind of interesting, though, if, if you remember last Wednesday, uh, we were considering a testimony of Peter that was a wonderful testimony, amen? It was just, it was just last week that we were considering the passage of Scripture where Peter made a wonderful confession uh, in, in faith in Jesus Christ, in being, him being the Christ, the Son of God, amen? Uh, he was, he, you know, we, know, we know he was the outspoken apostle, right? He was uh, saying out of character for Peter, we could say, right? Um, and, and, and I think there's a lot, and this is something we need to be careful with, um, as, as much as we wanted really quick... Uh, uh, talk talk bad about that. We gotta understand that a lot of us can can fall temptation to that, or right? can be tempted uh, to do that as well. I think there's a lot of folks out there that, that speak before they take time to think. And uh, I know I know I've been there. I know I've been there. Um, and and I'm sure that we could all, and maybe maybe all of us could testify of a, of a moment in time and a time where we said something in haste uh, that is so hard to take back once it's come out of your mouth. Amen. And uh, and so. It's Peter is just a perfect example of that, saying something very quickly without thinking uh, before he spoke. And so, uh, of course, this, this conversation is not just about uh, Jesus and Peter. They certainly are the two primary characters in these few verses that we've read. Uh, it's, when we think back to that last passage of Scripture we talked about, Peter, we saw, saw him uh, considered uh, this, this uh, 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 recorded some words that were 
wonderful and compelling and encouraging, uh, but in this passage of scripture, a completely different, difficult, a totally different conversation taking place here uh, in, in here. And, uh, you know, Peter, um, he spoke in the first passage where we talked about last week, he spoke from a, from a heart that was really in tune with Christ. Amen. He was in tune with the Lord. He was in tune with God's leadership. Uh, but now in this passage of scripture, we find him very quickly turning and, and him speaking from a heart that's motivated by the flesh, led by satanic influence. And uh, so as we think about these uh, these aspects of this conversation, some of the thoughts regarding this, this conversation by the grace of God, I'd like to preach on this thought for just a minute, looking to Calvary, looking to Calvary. I really hope that as we look at this conversation, we will just... It, it'll help strengthen our faith, but also uh, encourage or strengthen our devotion to the Lord as well. So the first thing, if you're taking notes, you want an outline to go along with this. In verse number 31, the first thing I'd say is you see the revelation of Jesus, okay? And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed. And after the after three days, rise again. So as the Savior speaking with the disciples, he's offering them a, a, a prophetic word uh, about God's future program, amen? He, he's, he's talking about what's yet to come to pass or what's about to come to pass and uh, certainly revealing uh, to the disciples and and uh, certainly I, I, it caught the disciples by, you could maybe say by surprise, it caught them maybe a little off guard, if you will. That first part of verse number 31, we see the importance. The Bible says, and he began to teach them. Now, uh, and I think that's interesting, the wording there. I don't believe that this is saying that this is the very beginning and he starts to instruct them or teach them. Jesus has been trying to teach his disciples the whole way. All of the lessons that we've learned, there's been an awful lot of teaching, a lot of intimate moments with him and his disciples where he's teaching them and planning them. But this is a definite shift in his preparation for his disciples uh, as, he is, as he is getting close uh, to this time. You know, we, at this point in time, they've been with him approximately three years now. So that means we are approaching Calvary. Uh, we are getting close to Calvary. And, uh, and so in all of those, in all of those, all of this time, he's been growing them, he's been maturing them, he has been teaching them, but now we see, we see the beginning of, of teaching them about really getting into depth about Calvary, really, really get into depth uh, about the cross. I kind of thought about, I thought about our personal walk, and you know, our, our personal walk is always growing, amen? Uh, we, we, we talk about in scripture, we talk about scripture being the milk, the milk uh, of the word, we talk about that for those that are growing and beginning to grow, grow in the Lord. We talk about the meat of the word. And, and uh, let, me, uh, let me just, uh, I, I have to put this disclaimer in there because if you have to tell me uh, that you are so mature and you have to tell me about how mature you are and how God has been giving you so much of the meat of the word because of how mature you are, you're probably not very mature in the Lord. Amen. Amen. The mature Christians out there today, will be, you'll very, very, very rarely if ever, hear them say anything about their own personal maturity, uh, they will simply live out that maturity. Amen. If they are mature in the Lord, they will take the meat of the word. It will literally grow them closer to the Lord, and you will see Christ more in them. Amen. It's not. A, I guess I said all that to say it's not a bragging rights. I think sometimes, just like just like the problems that the Corinthian church had with the different gifts and the various gifts, everybody wants that. Well, I, listen, I don't. I don't want to be the one to admit that I'm still drinking the milk of the word. No, I had me, I just this morning, I had me a big old juicy steak in the Word of God because I'm dripping with maturity. I don't ever want anybody to think that I'm uh, young in my Christian faith or anything like that. Can I tell you, I, I believe, I believe, and maybe some of our silver hair saints can testify to this, the milk of the Word still blesses your heart today. Amen. Amen. I think that uh, when I think that uh, all the way till I go to glory, there will still be great truth, a great blessing, great encouragement from the simple things in Scripture. Sure. Amen. At the same time, as we grow, it's a blessing that God reveals some things to us that maybe we didn't understand quite as clearly as before. I don't know if that's an exact parallel to what's going on here with the disciples, but certainly a growth uh, process taking place in, in our Christian life. Growth is a blessing. Amen. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to personally experience growth, be able to look back in your life and say, wow, I, I, I personally am growing in the Lord. I'm, God has, has, has met this need and I'm my faith has grown, and I'm, I'm trusting him more, and I'm acting on that trust more, and my behavior is changing. Be able to look to see, as I just read scripture, he's revealing things to me. Not that there's new truths to be revealed, that there's nothing changed in, in the word of God, but sometimes application uh, or, or passage of scripture won't be illuminated to us the same uh, when we're younger in our faith or when we're less mature in our faith, because it's just, we're just not quite ready for that. The disciples weren't quite ready. 
for the cross. They weren't quite ready for Calvary. God was working them up to that, and the Savior now is beginning to really share with them uh, what they need to know about the cross. Uh, and then uh, also in, in verse number 31 here, we see not only the importance, but in all of verse 31, we see the implications here. Um, uh, and so as Jesus he begins to reveal the, uh, re reveal um, what was previously not fully understand of the disciples, he's saying the first time, I don't believe this is the first time that he has mentioned uh, the cross or mentioned the sacrifice. And it's certainly not the first time Jesus and his sacrifice is mentioned in Scripture because it's, pro uh, it's prophesied all the way back to the Old Testament. And so these these uh, disciples, if they had any knowledge of the Word of God, you know, knew that the, that they had to have known something about the sacrifice of Messiah. Um, and so as he's revealing some of this unknown truth or these this this, this revealing this truth to the disciples, he offers some great details about some events that were yet uh, that were about to come to pass. He spoke of his rejection and. Uh, you know, to this point, uh, we've seen a lot of popularity, a lot of acceptance um, in, in, for his miracles. Amen. Uh, when you look at Jesus and his miracles, everybody wants his miracles. Amen. Everybody wanted the, the power. Everybody wanted to be healed. They all like that. Um, but as things start to get more serious, amen. I always think about uh, uh, Brother John. I always think about how quick people turn when he, when, he, when the rubber meets the road and he say he defines what a real disciple. It's amazing how quickly everybody's like, no, 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 no. But we see that in our own Christian life, though, too, right? I, 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 remember, I remember doing a disciple years ago, disciple, discipling a fellow years ago. And uh, really, we went to that passage of Scripture for discipleship, and I was trying to tell him what the discipleship was. He got up, and he said, you're right. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not willing to do that. <laughs> he never came back to discipleship again. And that wasn't what that, that wasn't what God Jesus was trying to do there. He wasn't trying to get people to roll run away. He wasn't trying to get people to stop being disciples. He was just trying to tell them what they expected of him. But but this is I mean that that was first hand first hand uh, experience with, with exactly what Jesus dealt with as he got closer to the cross. And so his rejection, certainly he's prophesied about his rejection, and, if, and he began to teach that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests. And scribes, he was going to go through a time of intense rejection. Amen. Uh, they were going to they were going to reject him. Folks that should have accepted him, folks that should have embraced him, those should have been the first to embrace him. They were they were very quick to oppose him. And in their rejection, they wanted to hinder his ministry. In their rejection, they they sought to hinder or minimize his influence. Uh, but of course, this uh, this was uh, this was he knew and he was prophesying that. This was going to increase as it neared the end. And listen, there is, it might not be the exact same, but there is intense rejection that continues in our day. Right. Amen. Not only in our own personal walk, sometimes sometimes if somebody will get born again, they'll get saved. Just like, I believe that fellow was born again, genuinely born again. But when, when, you, when, but when it comes down to sacrificing the follow of the Lord, man, things, it, it got real. And the decision was fight or flight, I guess. I don't know. He didn't fight for the Lord or flight out of here. He took flight out of here. And, uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of folks that uh, there's, there's that still, that kind of rejection still takes place. And then there's also just the vehement opposition to the things of the Lord. And that's still, of course, in our day, we still have a spirit of rejection uh, taking place in, in our day, uh, even, even now. And it'll continue, amen. It will continue. And uh, as I think, as the days get darker, it will get worse, amen. It's a work. We're, we, just as he's preparing his disciples, for his future rejection, we can have a confidence that there is preparation in Scripture for you and I when we deal with rejection, because we will deal with rejection. Every person that we knock on the door, every person we give a gospel tract to is not going to be excited that we're witnessing to them. Uh, many of them will say, I don't want your Jesus. And uh, brother, uh, brother Austin was telling me, and he always tries to witness, I love it, and uh, he's got different accounts and different things he's doing with, with lawn care things, and he met up with us. Doing some work for this lady, and uh, he was really hoping he was trying to get a uh, witness in there. And uh, man, he he mentioned being part of our church, and it was kind of he was trying to use that as a break in ice to try to kind of get in and talk about that. She said, "Well, you can do that at your church. You have fun with that. Don't bring that stuff around here." And uh, you know, he was very very quick to shut him off on that. Uh, people are going to be like that. It's just going to happen. We can't. We're not. Not everybody uh, is going to accept Christ, and there's going to be a lot of rejection along the way. He also he also talks about he also reveals. Uh, his crucifixion, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man uh, must uh, suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the, and the chief priests and scribes and be killed. Amen? So, now, I, I'm sure that 
they were understanding the rejection part. They'd already seen some of that, but I'm sure this kind of maybe halted their thoughts a little bit. I mean, just imagine, they're men just like just like you and I are, just, just part of Adam's race, just like you and I are, uh, with, with the same uh, human emotions that you and I have, and you just try to imagine yourself in this situation, in this conversation, you just imagine some of the facial expressions, some of the inner turmoil that they may have been going through. They're, wait, wait, what, wait, I understand the rejection part, but when you're trying to, what, what, you're gonna, you're gonna die? Wait a minute. Listen, that wasn't what they were expecting. Remember, remember, the Jews, they expected Messiah to come and take up, take up that, that uh, the throne of David. Now listen, his disciples had that kind of in their mind too. They kind of hoped that, that, he, was, that he was here to stay. And I, I'm not going to fault them for that. I, I, I mean, I, I guess I, I'd probably been worried if they were happy that he went. Amen. I, they loved him and they were thankful to be with him. And they spent so many years with him uh, in, in service. And they, they loved being around the Savior. So, so naturally, they didn't want him to go. Amen. Uh, but they didn't expect it to end this way. They didn't expect this. I'm sure that was probably caught off guard a little bit. And, um, you know, we, 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 uh, we move on here. Then we, we also see... Uh, I'm, I'm skipping over a little bit of stuff, but just, uh, I could park on a lot of these things, but we'll, we'll just move on. Going on here, the last part of verse 31, he also prophesied, talks about his resurrection, uh, and be killed, listen, listen, I love this, after three days rise again. And that's pretty exciting stuff. Amen, he, 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 he promised the disciples that death wasn't, death wasn't going to keep them. Amen, he promised, listen, yes, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be rejected, you understand that. Death probably caught you off guard, but I'm going to rise again on the third day. Amen? And, and uh, yeah, he was going to have to die on a cross because that was meant to be. That was God's plan. He was the Lamb of God. Amen? He came to die. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't, this, that wasn't a plan B. That wasn't an accident. It wasn't because God's plans got messed up along the way. He sent him here with the purpose to die as a sacrifice for man's sin. Amen? That was the plan from the beginning. Amen? And uh, so, of course, he was going to die on a cross. That was the plan, but that death wasn't going to hold him. Amen. The grave couldn't hold him. After three days, he'd rise again. Now, let me, let, let, just to the credit of the disciples, they, as, as I said earlier, they were only men. And, and so going from this, we see Peter, we, we're, we're going to go right in. This next point is Peter rebuking, rebuking the Savior, okay? And so the only thing I can assume is that somehow they got stuck on the death thing yeah. and didn't hear the resurrection part. Because I can't imagine in any, I can't imagine anybody in their right mind wanting to rebuke the Savior after he just said that he was miraculously going to rise again on the third day. That to me tells me everything's going to be okay. Amen. And so I, 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 I'm, I'm, I, I guess I'm presuming a little. Okay. Uh, I, I try not to do that. You know, I try not to do that. But that's the only, that's the only explanation that I can come up with uh, from that passage of scripture, going from. Uh, some bad news, and I'm sure they got hung up on that, and then going to some really good news, and somehow in there, they didn't hear that good news clear enough, uh, because then we go into number point number two, we see verse 32, we see the rebuke of Peter. The Bible says, and he spake that saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. So, the, the record in, in the book of Mark here, it reports for us that, that uh, the rebuke of Peter toward, toward Christ uh, our Lord. Uh, look at the setting here, now that first part of verse 32 says, and he spake that saying openly. This wasn't hidden, amen? It wasn't taken, it wasn't given or delivered to them in privacy. This was something he spoke out openly. It wasn't, he wasn't hush-hush, he wasn't, he wasn't whispering at this point. At, at this point, we're getting close to Calvary, amen? He, 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 he's making a public, uh, he's, he's giving public testimony as to what the plans are uh, for God's future program, amen? Uh, and and this, was, this was clearly planned, and it was a clear public statement of the Lord. And I think a, a, a challenge, uh, brought a challenge to me as I thought about this. Uh, you know, Jesus openly was speaking about the suffering that he was about to endure. Openly testifying about the rejection, about the death, uh, amen, about the horrific death that he was just about ready, ready to die. Dying on that old, old rugged cross of Calvary. He's preaching, uh, pre preaching what's about to happen. Of course, preaching, uh, proclaiming the wonderful and the glorious resurrection. Uh, and he was publicly, listen, he was publicly proclaiming the gospel. Amen? He was publicly proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. I was encouraged, I was challenged, because I wonder how many times, I wonder how, how many times we, we we're not, I'm not going to say we're ashamed of the gospel, I wonder how many times we go real gentle and, uh, and real cautious in our delivery of the gospel. I wonder how many times we're kind of, it was your take, Get out of there real quick. Hey, preacher, I handed out 25 gospel tracts today. They see your face when you hand them out? Don't, don't ask that question. 
Listen, I handed it to I, I sent it to them as a paper airplane, and they got the gospel, okay? Uh, don't judge me, amen? Uh, you know, I, and I, obviously, that's an exaggeration. But I think sometimes, I'm not saying that we're ashamed of the gospel, but sometimes we're, maybe, maybe we're a little worried on the delivery part of it. And, um, you know, Jesus is out, he's, his, the Bible tells us, he, he, he says this openly. He is proclaiming the gospel. What's about to happen to him, for our, for our goodness, for our, for our salvation, uh, I, I think it just challenged me in, in uh, proclaiming, being willing to publicly proclaim the gospel, just never having any shame, never having any worry, any concern, and just being willing to be bold and sharing my faith, uh, knowing Jesus Christ as Savior. So we see not only the, the setting there, but then we go on at the second part of verse number 32, and we see the setting here, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. So again, Peter, he's reacting, he's reacting before he's taking the time to really think through the actions. Uh, I'd like to think that if you really thought back through and processed for just a moment what the Savior said, that last part, just like you and I, we're processing it, we see that on paper, we see it wrote out, and so we see, yes, rejection's horrible, yes, death is horrible, but man, the Bible says right here, he's going to raise again. And so if he would have took a little bit more time maybe to process that, uh, maybe he could have, maybe he would have responded a little bit differently, but he, he, he reacted very quickly, he didn't think through his actions, and he pulls Jesus to the side, and he's hoping to, uh, open, hoping that Maybe in his mind he would be able to correct him before this gets too a far out of hand. He don't want Jesus to die. He don't want he don't want him to have to, to go through this place of death. And this uh, this this wasn't this wasn't in Peter's plans. This wasn't in Peter's ambitions. Amen. Uh, he he listened. He, he he maybe he was thinking that Jesus misspoke and uh, and, and he, he wanted to make sure he, he prevented any further talk of this death stuff uh, with Jesus. Now at this moment. Peter did not want to embrace the cross. And, and, and look, there's a lot of folks out there today uh, that don't want to embrace the cross. Amen? They seek any means of salvation other than uh, the cross. I know that's not an exact parallel, but certainly a, certainly a parallel as we consider this. There's a lot of folks out there that deny the cross. And can I tell you, any theology out there, any teaching out there uh, that denies and rejects the cross of Christ is, is a false religion, is a false right. teaching uh, it, the cross was an absolute must, amen? Uh, Jesus had to die on the cross. If he had not died on the cross and rose again on that glor glorious day, you and I would still be in our sins uh, and condemned to die in our sin, amen? And so uh, the, there was no death on the cross. There would be no salvation for you and I. Um, we would not be redeemed, amen, if Christ had not died on the cross for our sin. And so we see uh, that rebuke of, of Peter. Then we see, lastly here, I'm trying to move quickly here, we see the resolve of Jesus, verse 33. The Bible says, but when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. This is interesting. I, I, I don't ever, I would never want anybody to, to say that about me Definitely would never want my Savior to say that about me. And although Peter, of course, he's upset, Jesus reminds Jesus, he, he just stays steadfast. I mean, he stays committed to God's will. He stays committed to the, to the will of the Father. Uh, his face was set toward Calvary. He knew that's where he had to go. Uh, he, he had a resolve to follow through as, as that sacrifice for yours, your sin and my sin. Amen. Notice the rebuke there in that first part of verse 33. But when he had heard about, he looked on his disciples, uh, I'm sorry, looked on his disciples and he rebuked Peter, saying, get thee behind me, Satan. Uh, so Peter rebuked Jesus, but the Lord, he got the last word, amen. Jesus, he wasn't, and I don't think that he was, Peter was not actually Satan, okay? I don't believe that's what, I don't believe that's what the takeaway from this passage of scripture is that he was actually Satan, but he was referring to the attitude and the actions of Peter at this moment. The influence in Peter's life was revealing a satanic influence more than a leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? Uh, Peter allowed himself at that moment, because of his anxiety, because of his fear, because of his concern about the future events and the future programs, he allowed in that moment to be uh, himself to be used by Satan rather than to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. I am, that sounds harsh. Amen. But you know, there's, there's, there's a, that happens, amen, in our life. Well, you've heard me talk about that before. But you know, that, that's simply Peter acting in the flesh, not according to the Spirit. I mean, it's, it's really simple, but, but when you think about when we are opposed to the Lord, 
What is the definition or what is the reverse definition of opposition to Jesus? Antichrist. Yeah. Right? It's a spirit of Antichrist. It's, a, it's that attitude, that satanic attitude, that satanic influence. That sounds all kind of boogeyman and scary, and I guess to, to a certain extent it kind of is. But could you imagine, I would never want that testimony, a Christian, dear child of God, if you're saved today, we ought to never want that testimony uh, where, where when we are, we are acting in our flesh so much, so clearly, so plainly, that at that moment, we look more like Satan than we do look like our Savior and led by the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? That's a, that's a, a, I, I would never want anybody to say that, let alone this is what, this is what the Savior said. Amen? Listen, Jesus didn't want, or Satan didn't want Jesus to offer himself on the cross. He knew what that meant. He tried to stop. Uh, he tried to stop Jesus from being born because he knew that that sacrifice would take place. He did not want him to die as a sacrifice uh, for our sin. And even today, the spirit of Antichrist hinders, tries to hinder the message of the cross uh, and, and hopes to hinder the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's, it's still here today. It was there in that day. That, that attitude, that, that satanic influence was there in that day. Uh, it is in our day. And that's not to be, a, that's not to, that's not to be spooky. That's not to freak you out. That's not to cause you to lose sleep. That is to make sure that we are aware because the Bible tells us be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because our adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion uh, walking about seeking whom he may devour. I may have got a couple words off there. You know the verse, uh, Second Peter, 1 Peter 5 First Peter 5 8. 1 Peter 5 8. You know the verse. I was very close. I probably like 95%. I apologize, Lord, if I was, if I was bad on that. Uh, if, that's a, if that version would be constituted as a per version, I apologize. Um, but the, you know, you understand the truth there, amen? We, we've got to, we, it, it, it's a sobering reality that there is a spirit of Antichrist even in this day. We've got to be, listen, I want to be led by the spirit. I want God to be lead. I want God to have the, have the reins of my life, amen? I want God to have the steering wheel, whatever, whatever, uh, 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 illustration you want to use. I want God in charge of my life. I want him leading. I don't ever want to be confused uh, who, who I follow. Amen? Uh, and we see not only the, the rebuke, and then we see the reality in that, that second part of verse 33, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of man. Peter had spoken in a moment of passion. He had spoken in a moment where he was motivated to being led by his flesh. His words did not honor God. They did not submit to the will of God. They did not submit to Christ. This was a word. His words were spoken in flesh, by fleshly leadership, according to the lust of the flesh. And it was certainly contrary to the plan of God. At that moment, moment Peter was more concerned with his personal desires than he was the will of God. It, 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 and now it's easy for us to go, oh, Peter, how in the world could you, could you do that, man? I mean... How how did you how could you do that? You know how often, how often, when nobody else is looking? How often, when the pressure's on? How often in the storms are we tempted, and do we sometimes fail in, in a very similar fashion? Uh, we don't ever, uh, nobody, of course, will ever call out and start rebuking God. But how often do our actions say otherwise, or say what we're actually thinking? Amen. How often do we side with the flesh? How often do we allow our flesh to make the decision, denying the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God, that uh, the, the prompting of the Word of God? How often do we do that? And uh, listen, we, we need to we need to be sure that our attitudes and our actions are consistent with God's will. Amen. That's 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 simply that's the will of God. That's His plan. That our attitudes, our actions, would be lined up and motivated and. and, uh, and Consistent with the will of God instead of being motivated by the flesh, motivated by what our flesh wants. We've said it often, our flesh is a formidable foe. Our adversary is the devil, but he, he certainly has a way of getting our flesh to get us in a lot of trouble. Amen? He got Peter in trouble. Peter was just testifying some wonderful truth. Amen? Christ, you're the Lord. You are the Savior. Amen? What a blessing. Peter said some wonderful things. Then quickly, boom, all of a sudden he's back in the flesh again. You and I, are, we can, every one of us, are, we can be just like Peter. And uh, we, we've got to be careful. We've got to be cautious. Uh, and uh, and, and that's, I think that takes a submitted attitude, right? A submitted attitude to the Lord uh, and, and, try, and purposely to, to take that extra little moment or so to, uh, to process what God's doing so that we react appropriately. 
And in that moment of processing, the Holy Spirit of God had the opportunity to, to lead us, amen, to direct us because we didn't act in haste. Usually, always maybe, I don't know, vast majority of the time, when we act in haste, it's going to be a bad action. And that's going to be, it's going to come out with, a, with, a, with some difficult situations. Let me close really quickly. Uh, you know, this, the Savior, he spoke about uh, the gospel as we in, in this text that we read today. Uh, he, he is, he is the gospel, amen? Uh, he is the gospel. He is our Savior. He is our Redeemer, amen? The Redeemer of the world, Redeemer of uh, mankind. He's our Savior, amen? Uh, and what a blessing we see. We actually see the Savior proclaiming the gospel even before uh, the, the work of the gospel, his work on the cross is even completed. He's proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of uh, Jesus. So exciting. And uh, so I hope that, I, I mean, I know that in our group here on Wednesday night, uh, most of us, if not all of us, have made the decision to accept Jesus as Savior. Somebody may tune into the uh, to the preaching later on, I don't know, uh, that don't know Christ as Savior, the most important thing, the most important takeaway is the joy and the wonder of salvation, amen, as we see this gospel, I, we received him as Savior, hopefully, if you're not, if you haven't received Christ as Savior, the most important thing to be done when you hear this gospel message is receive Christ as Savior, uh, do it right now, amen, that is, I guess, the, the decision that we can make in haste, uh, that we don't have to think about very much, that does not, does not end up with, with a bad uh, a bad reaction, amen. And that is that is right now in haste, except Jesus is Savior. I think everything else we need to slow down a little bit about that one right there. Uh, that is one. That, I think that's the only one in Bible we see God say you can make haste about this one, amen. Uh, it, and, and so if you're if you are saved though, if you are saved, uh, listen, I hope that we'd be challenged to share the gospel, amen. Share the gospel. You think about what these fellows were going through. You think about what our Savior went through. Uh, you think about think about him. He, he's contemplating. Think about this. Our, our Savior allowed Himself to be under the same feelings that you and I felt. Can you imagine the anxiety that you would feel, the, the, the worry that you would feel if you knew that on, at a certain prescribed time that you were going to feel about the worst pain that humanity could ever feel, and that you would have the power to remove that pain, but you were going to go through that voluntarily, willingly. To, as you offered yourself as a sacrifice. You just imagine that our Savior allowed himself to feel those things, to be able to experience those feelings so that he could say that we have a, a Savior that's not been, that, that we can have a Savior, that we can say that our Savior was not, was, was not a Savior that hasn't been touched with those infirmities, amen, that we, he, he knows what we're feeling. He knows the pain we go through, and yet he went, he went. And so he was proclaiming, he was contemplating on, he was proclaiming the gospel before the finished work was, 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 was complete, amen. You and I are looking back on Calvary. Calvary's done. The price has been paid. You and I have salvation, and God has given us a, a, a commission. Amen. He's given us a command, an expectation for us to go, get out there and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the lost and dying people. Uh, let us make sure that we're faithful uh, in that proclaiming of the gospel. Amen. God's so good to us, and there's so many lost folks out there that, that need to hear about Jesus. Amen. Let's go ahead and dismiss in prayer tonight. All right, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this message. Uh, from your word, we thank you so much for these three verses, these loaded uh, three verses. Uh, Father, I, I, I don't know if uh, maybe another time we look at this, there would be something else that stands out in, in the area of application, so I don't know if this was exhausted to, to what it ought to be, but um, I, I do thank you for what we were able to see um, uh, this evening. And I just pray, God, you help us to, I don't know, we probably spoke to our hearts, maybe even completely different than what the outline was, was given, because I, I do believe that you can very personal, very precise in some of the things we need, and so I just pray, God, whatever we took from tonight uh, in this message, that, that we would that we would uh, obey you, that we would we would yield to you, and we would allow you to work that with that work that you are uh, attempting in our hearts, even at, even at this moment. Uh, be with us as we travel out of here tonight. Give us safety as we travel home again. Be with the Fosters tonight, uh, as Brother Bob is uh, uh, dealing with pain, trying to deal with pain. Uh, be with Miss Alice tonight; she's in the hospital as well. We lift them up to you, Lord. Just please ask for your protection over them or loved ones that are in the hospital. Just, just please uh, be with them tonight. We just want to thank you in advance for uh, all that you're going to continue to do in the lives of these dear folks here. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name.